Welcome to Worldwide Bible Class. I'm Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, pastor of St. Paul and Jesus Deaf Lutheran Churches in Austin, Texas, and we are studying the life of Jacob together with Martin Luther. We're in Genesis chapter 33, verse 11, and here we are. Now, if you're watching this recorded, by the way, um, or listening to the podcast, you should join us live sometime. It's a lot of fun, and uh, and that's a good time. I'm, so I'm, that's what I'm, I'm checking the chat for all the people who are live to pay attention to that as well. Now, he, just to remind us where we are, uh, Jacob wrestled with the Lord Jesus all through the night on the four river Jabbok. And he, as Luther says, overcame God and man, or at least through this wrestling, the Lord now not only turns his face to, in kindness to Jacob, but now also he's changed Esau's face. And Jacob now has a good conscience, and he's going to rejoice before God in this goodwill. So he goes across the river, and he meets um, he meets Esau, and Esau is pleased to see Jacob. He the, his, He's not going to destroy him with these 400 men. Uh, he's going to bless him. And look at what verse 10, what Jacob says. No, please, if I have found favor in your sight, receive my present from my hand. They're trying to give gifts to each other. Inasmuch as I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. It's a, it's one of these, uh, you know, when you were talking about um, mercy or the grace of God, uh, this was one of the big uh, controversies of the Reformation. What is the grace of God? Is this a substance? Is this, is it poured out into us? Is it something that the Lord infuses us with? And the and the Lutherans came along and said, no, the grace of God is His smiling face. It's the way He looks at us. And this in when God smiles, now the whole world starts to smile at us. And this is the great comfort of a good conscience. So so uh, Jacob discerns the same face of God in the face of his brother Esau. For he sees the good pleasure of God's will and the good will in favor of his brother. In the same manner, the face of God shines forth in all his creatures because they are works of God and testimonies of, of God's will and presence. So that uh, by these, by, by his creation, he coaxes us with an external aspect, just as he shows his winsome and kindly face to us inwardly in our heart by the word and promises. So that... Uh, so that this is um, this is a, a, a beautiful th way that, especially when the Lord delivers us a good conscience by the forgiveness of our sins, then we start to see God's smile everywhere. Now, the, the opposite happens is that when we have a bad conscience or a troubled conscience, we see God's frown everywhere. We run at the shaking of a leaf and so forth and so on. So, so the Lord is reminding us of his favor in all creatures and uh, externally by creation and all the gifts of creation, internally in our heart to faith by the word and promises. This is a true explanation of this idiom so that no one should interpret it as flattery and idolatry. This is the, so Luther's interacting with some of the old interpretations that we talked about last week. So uh, he's not saying that Esau is God. He's talking about the results of a good conscience. He adds an explanation or a proclamation of mutual love and goodwill in his brother when he says, you have received me favorably, you have wished me well. The word raon, ratzon, signifies will, good pleasure, goodwill. Psalm 51, 18, we read, do good in Zion and thy good pleasure, O Lord. Matthew 17, 5, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And Luke 2, 14, we have the phrase goodwill, eudokia to men. Now, interestingly, just, I mean, note how, and this this is always, I think, just as theological students uh, and language Bible students, we note this, how Luther grabs a hold of a word, and then the way he teaches what that word means is he quotes another place where we see it. <laughs> and this, before he had, Luther did not have Logos software to track it down instantly where the word is. He just... They knew these things. Oh, it puts us to shame. And then, but not only does he go fluently to the other Hebrew places, he switches to the New Testament where that same idea comes forth, uh, even though it's in Greek. Goodwill to men, that's in the Gloria. Uh, this is in the announcement at the baptism of Jesus. 
So, um, so Luther's using the other context to explain it. It's an, it's a marvelous teaching tool. I wish, hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm mostly reminding myself about how to do this as well, that this is what, that we, when we're working through the texts, we're, we're trying to connect these dots. So Jacob wants to say, I see that you're pleased with me. You receive me graciously, embrace and kiss me, weep with me. You refuse to accept my gift and are more ready to give than to receive. So you declare your goodwill and good pleasure toward me. Towards me. Therefore, receive a small gift, a pledge uh, of our mutual love so that it may testify that I acknowledge your goodwill. But he calls the gifts blessing. He says, receive the blessing which I have brought to you and which God had given me. For God has dealt kindly with me, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, notice, and, and this just maybe as an aside on our way as we're getting deeper into the commentary here, is that Luther will oftentimes rephrase what's going on, putting it in his own words to make sure that, um, uh, to make sure we understand it. So this is what Jacob wants to say. Uh, Luther will do that with the characters of the scripture. He'll do it with, um, he'll do it even with God. This is what the Lord wants to say. This is what we're saying to the Lord. So he's rephrasing these things. And it's one of those great exercises, you know, could you put it into your own words? So what is Jacob saying here? And Jacob is saying, you have received me. Your face is turned from anger to joy at me. So receive this blessing, this thing that I've received from the Lord, I'm going to pass on to you as a uh, as an indication of our mutual love and affection for one another. These are assuredly words of a heart overflowing with boundless joy and gladness. So this is not no longer fearful. He's he's come through the dark night of the soul, the night of wrestling with God and man. He's overcome in the contest. And now it's boundless joy and gladness. He rejoices with his whole heart. And he congratulates himself because he has won his brother's love. And again, not by anything that he's done, but by the, by the gift of God himself. The serenity which follows the, followed the storm and darkness of the former struggle with his brother and the man is therefore very beautiful and pleasant. So boundless joy and gladness Rejoicing with his whole heart, his brother's love, he has it, the serenity which follows the storm and darkness of the former struggle with his brother and the man is therefore very beautiful and pleasant. I think the man there refers to Jesus, the wrestling. I think that's what that's talking about. You you hear, I think, echoes in in this paragraph of, of Luther's own struggles and of of all of of all of us who are christian who know this this deep wrestling with god and man and the and the great difficulty and the great sorrow that comes out of it and the resulting gladness he rejoices with his whole heart I see, he says, that God and my brother are appeased out of wonderful goodness. So it signifies great joy when he said above, my life is preserved. It seems to me that I am now truly reviving from death and hell because I have seen the kindly and friendly face of God. A wonderful modesty and humility shines forth in these words. For he wants to say, and again, this is how, you know, Luther will do this. This is what Jacob wants to say, I have not brought a magnificent and imposing gift, which is worthy of admiration, but it is the blessing of God. I beg you to accept it on this account, that it may be a pledge and reminder of my gratitude and the blessing of God by whose gift and grace I offer this to you, such as it is. Receive it. Uh, therefore, because God has given it to me in the name of the Lord, just as it had, it had been offered to you by God, so that the blessing may also be with you and increase without end, and that this goodwill and mutual brotherly love may continue with us forever. So Jacob says, 
to, to, to Esau, just receive this small gift. It's a pledge of this joy that the Lord has given to us, this reconciliation that the Lord has worked. Uh, John says, so when God is expressing his grace and boundless joy and gladness and smiling on us, is he not proud of us? Mm, I don't know. I don't, I, it would be strange. I, I don't know. John, you might have to say a little bit more. I, I'm not sure how to think of God being proud of us. I think God is merciful to us and he loves us. And that love is for the sake of Christ. In other words, it's, he, we are accepted. This is the biblical language. We are accepted in the beloved, in the beloved. So that in the Father's affection for the Son, uh, we are infection, affectionately embraced by God. So I don't know. I, I don't know how to. If um, oh, I see what you're saying, like we look at our grandchildren and we're proud of them. Yeah, I, I would. It's it could be a different. Um, yeah, I know what. You, I, that's right. We probably need a different word for that. Because the word pride, I suppose when we have, what what would we, you know, there's pride towards ourselves. That's normally how we think of the sinful pride. But pride in other people, joy at seeing the benefit of other people, we probably need another, a better word for that. Esteem, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jill says, a pledge of mutual love when the conscience is clean. That makes me think of all the pledges in the Old Testament were given attached to an earthly gift, the pledge of love from Jesus and baptism in the supper. This is a great point, is that the Lord always, um, well, almost always, there's a sign and token of the shared love and affection. And and it's good for us to remember that even though we say that baptism and the Lord's Supper are more than a sign, they're not less than a sign. They're a, they're a sign and token given so that the Lord can can show that reconciliation. Previously, we'll, we'll continue here with Luther. Uh, previously, Esau said, I have rav, that is plenty. Jacob says, I have coal, that is everything, totality. He amplifies his blessing. I have not only, I not only have abundance, I have everything. These are words of a person in exaltation. Where's, uh, I have enough. This is the, uh, no, no, that's what we're brothers. You, God has dealt graciously. I have enough. He urged me, took it. Hmm. I don't know where I don't. Oh, there it is. Yeah. I okay. It's it was hidden down in there. So this I, the, what's translated here. I have enough. Is Jacob really says I have everything. I not only have abundance. I have everything. Now and compare that though, because he doesn't. Here's Esau who does have a lot. I mean, he's got a big army. He's got a big family. He's got all this land and wealth and power. Compared to Jacob, who, although he has at this point 11, 12 children, 11 boys, one girl, he does not have a lot of, he certainly doesn't have an army. Compared to Esau, he's poor, and yet he says, I have everything. I've got everything. Why? Because he has God and the good favor of God and God on his side, who's giving him everything else, including his brother back. These are words of a person in exaltation and transport over the joy occasioned by the face of God and brother, shown to him in grace, mercy, and goodwill. If only I have God's grace and yours, he means to say, it's enough and more than enough for me. I wouldn't suffer any loss if I gave everything to you. I'm losing nothing. I shall never be in need since you have become reconciled to me. I am a rich Lord because I have God and you as my friends. This is so great. I mean, this is just kind of mar this this the 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 glory of Jacob and and especially compared to the to the struggle that he was in all the night before this shows how faith revived and was aroused in Jacob and how he now reigns and triumphs again for Jacob has now come to the conclusion that his blessing is equal to all the wealth of the whole world previously he had nothing when he said, my brother will come and smite me and my wives and my whole household. At that point, he had nothing at all because he was in despair. But heaven and earth are again filled for him with all the good things and resources of the whole world. For unbelief robs us of God's mercy and our brothers 
and of the abundance of all things. So what's the difference? What is the difference between Jacob now, who, who is exalting and has everything, and before thought he had nothing and everything to lose and was in despair? And the difference is faith. <laughs> faith. Unbelief, lack of faith, robs us of God's mercy and of our brother's mercy and the abundance of all things. So that we see in this, we see in the story, we see in this account, Jacob as a man of faith. And the battle for Jacob is to believe the promise of the Lord. And, and that's been the, the, the thing the whole time. I mean, from the very beginning, when the Lord gave the word to, um, to, to Rachel, the you old the younger the older will serve the younger and is in this question is how is that word going to work itself out how is that promise going to come true but it's like 110 years later unbelief robs us of god's mercy and our brothers and of the abundance of all things but faith delivers them to us because faith which believes the promise of god and especially the promise of forgiveness gives us that clean conscience which which makes the whole world a gift. Moses, moreover, adds that Jacob compelled his brother to receive the gift. He says, Do not despise the blessing of God and my gift, lest it seem that you are not reconciled to me from your heart. For although I have no doubt, yet both of our families will suspect that your grace and favor are still uncertain. So that, And this is the idea that Luther suspects that Jacob and Esau are good. They are reconciled. They are simpatico. And yet everybody else is going to be like, wait, what's going on here? Jacob's and Esau, you know, Jacob's family is going to be like, wait, I thought Esau was mad. The soldiers who are with Esau are going to think, wait, I thought we were coming to destroy this guy. So he says, accept the sign and everyone can then see that we're at peace with one another. I beg you for the sake of brotherly love and goodwill, don't refuse this little gift. So verse 12, then Esau said, let us journey on our way and I'll go before you. But Jacob says to him, my Lord knows that the children are frail and the flocks and herds are giving sock and are a care to me. And if they're overdriven for a day, the flocks will die. So, so now um, Esau says, let me lead the way. You follow me. I'll protect you. And Jacob says, it's enough. You've, it's enough already. Uh, nothing else is needed. And, and so they are, they're going to go their way. I'll come to you at Seir. Esau wants to be thankful and do his brother a good turn. He offers to be the companion and guide and guide of his journey right up to the crossing of the Jordan. I want to kind of move through this quickly because it's kind of narrative comment, and Luther's moving pretty quickly as well. So you guys interrupt if you have if you have questions here. This was not done craftily, although it's likely that there were still suspicions in both households, the soldiers, the wives of Jacob. But Jacob was quite certain from the promise concerning his brother's change of will, and he understands that all this proceeds from a friendly and open heart. Yet he advises against this humiliation and service of his brother. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not necessary, he says, for you to be humiliated in this way, and this would be too hard for you, for my Lord knows that I have frail little ones, flocks that are breeding, sheep, young lambs, sucking calves that cannot follow without danger. We advance too quickly. Reuben was about 13 years old, not much more. Uh, Levi was 12, Judah 10 and so on, right down to Dinah, who had not exceeded her fourth year at the time of the crossing. So he brings uh, so he brings a crowd of little ones with him. So he's got, the kids are still small. Here, so here's Esau with his army, and here's Jacob with his little family. Well, it's not little, but with his family, with a bunch of little children. So children so delicate cannot follow Esau's company of horsemen and men under arms. So we'll be a hindrance and a burden to you, my brother, Jacob means to say. It was an absolutely honest refusal. So here Luther's pushing back on this idea that there's still some um, uh, fighting, still some uh, animosity. We have to understand that they're at, at peer. It's much more difficult to lead. And so he's going to go on to excuse this activity. Uh, it's much more difficult to lead an unwarlike and tender crowd of little ones than several company of knights, since indeed many things happen which hinder progress. 
and at times compel a halt for several days or hours. It takes infinite care to travel with a household. And this was especially true at that time when wagons were not in use uh, and little ones were placed on camels and asses. So Jacob is not making any pretense or lying when he says, we'll be a burden and hindrance to you. We'll delay your journey. We'll burden you with this troublesome company. But he is serious in asking him not to take the trouble upon himself, lest Esau bring forward any other excuse that he is willing to, um, to proceed more slowly or some such thing. He indicates in a veiled manner that this will be annoying to the armed men. Where did I go? Yeah, armed men who are in Esau's company. Indeed, he mentions the danger if the sheep were driven hard for a day. That's what the Hebrew word for to knock signifies, as we, for example, are accustomed to knock at a door. Flocks are driven with a rod or staff. If we were to urge them or drive them in such a way, they would keep pace with the horsemen. All the flocks and little ones would perish in a day. In German, the word is übertreiben, overdrive. It's more appropriate for you to go on ahead with your companies and for me to, to proceed slowly. Jill says, Romans 12, 10 says, be devoted to one another and brotherly love. Outdo yourself in honoring one another. That's a, that's a perfect verse for this. Uh, Sarah says, what's the possibility that God warned Esau? He did. He appeared to him in a dream. So we had that earlier. So that's a great point, too. So that the Lord, when Jacob was wrestling with, with Jesus, the Lord was also dealing with Esau. So we come to verse 14. Please let my Lord go on ahead before the servants. I'll lead on slowly at a pace which livestock, um, which the livestock that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord at Seir, which is where Esau's manor was. Uh, the Hebrew word nahal properly signifies to lead. And note here, again, this Luther's way of teaching this. Remember, and maybe by way of reminder, that these are lectures that Luther's giving in a seminary class or at the University of Wittenberg, and they were taking notes, and the notes were then published as the commentary. So he's teaching his, his guys how to do this, to lead, and he'll quote Psalm 31 and Psalm 23, lead and guide me, he leads me beside still waters, so that we're making these connections for the vocab. Really great. Uh, I will bring it to pass that they're led gently step by step, as sheep are led to pasture or water, so the cattle and the children don't perish. These are the duties of a shepherd. Concerning Absalom, David says, 2 Samuel 18, deal gently with young Absalom. But in addition... According to the pace of the cattle which are before me in Hebrew, according to the foot of the work of the little ones. So now Luther's going to dig into it's an idiom in the Hebrew, and so he's going to give the literal translations. According to the foot of the work and the little ones is how the literal translation would be. He calls the whole substance the work, malabka, and the same word. And here, so here we're going to get into this again the Hebrew, the way he's doing it. The same word occurs in the third commandment of the Decalogue. From this comes Melekech, Melekech, the work or the power of heaven, which brings force to bear on things below to make the earth fruitful and to produce rich harvest of fruits. Christ speaks in like manner, Luke 21, the powers of heaven will be shaken. But here he calls his whole household and substance work. So that Jacob, so that um, Jacob uses this word to describe the family and all the things that are there. Now Luther's going to just kind of make the Ten Commandment connection here. The whole household and substance is work, with the exception of the little ones and the women. So families excluded, but the 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 animals and everyone going with them. That's the work. In the Third Commandment, it's stated: Six days you shall labor and do all your work. That is, care for your property. But on the seventh day, you must keep the Sabbath, rest, and listen to the voice of the Lord your God, Exodus 23. Uh, so a further question is discussed. Oh, oh, so so this is just Luther working on this word. Now, next part. A further question is discussed here by others, whether Jacob lies when he says he'll come to Esau and Seir. So he says, I'll come to you in Seir, and then Esau tries to leave him some people, and he says, no, no, no problem. So Esau goes to Seir, and Jacob goes to Succoth. Verse 17, we're not there yet. But some say, well, Jacob was just trying to, to shake Esau. 
he was going to go a different way. You go, come, I'll, I'll lead you to Seir. And he says, I'll come and meet you in Seir. And then he goes to Succoth and never goes to Seir. So that there's, again, this attempt to kind of build the animosity with Jacob and Esau, and Luther's going to fight against them. But he's going to do it. He's, he's got to defend himself a little bit because he, because people are going to say, Luther, you're acting like the, the fathers have no sin at all. And he's just saying, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Okay. Further questions discussed here by others, whether Jacob lies when he says that he'll come to Esau and Seir, when there's no record anywhere that he went there. I've often stated that I do not free the saints from all sins. This is, he says, look, I'm not unwilling to say that Jacob lied. I'm not unwilling to say that Jacob cheated. I don't, it's possible that they can do these things. I'm not absolving them completely, but I am taking it case by case. We know that the greatest and most saintly men often fell in a horrible fashion and became contaminated, not only with error and common weaknesses, but also with the greatest sins, contrary to faith, hope, love, patience, namely with unbelief, doubt, disrespect, murmuring against God. So Luther's saying it's possible for Jacob to sin. It's possible that he could have lied. He, he could have committed a small sin, a common weakness. He also could have committed a great sin, which he did the night before. When his faith was struggling against despair, unbelief, doubt, disrespect, sins against faith, hope, and love. In this, we are willing to have them as allies and examples to comfort us. This is a really important line that Luther does not see in Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Moses, Noah. He does not see uh, perfection. He does not see a state of holiness where they could not have sinned. And the result of being able to recognize the sins of the saints is that they become examples of comfort when God has mercy on them. Now, this has to do with, I'm going to see if I can show this to you, this uh, this beautiful threefold honoring of the saints that our Lutheran fathers teach us. I pu I pulled this up before. This is the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article Twenty One, Paragraph Two. And so it's it's saying we don't we don't pray to the saints, we don't venerate the saints. We don't worship the saints, but we do honor the saints, and we, we give them a threefold honor. And the honor that Luther is talking about here is what the confessions are going to call the second honor of this threefold honor. So the first honor is thanksgiving. We thank God for showing examples of his mercy, revealing his will to save men, giving teachers and other great gifts to the church. Since these are the greatest gifts, we should extol them very highly. We should praise the saints themselves for using the gifts just as Christ praises the faithful businessmen. The second honor is the strengthening of our faith when we see Peter forgiven after his denial. We are encouraged to believe that grace does indeed abound more than sin. So that when we see that the saints are not only sinners, but that they're forgiven sinners— then we ourselves are comforted. The third honor is imitation, and that imitation has, has uh, two parts. First, of their faith, when we believe the promises that God give to them, and then be of the other virtues according to vocation, so that uh, we want to copy the faith of Jacob, and we want to copy the virtues of Jacob according to the callings which we have from God. But it's this second uh, honoring of the saints. Th this, by the way, this is so, this threefold honoring of the saints is so great. I mean, we should just try to memorize it and have it in our minds is that when we're reading the stories of the scriptures, there's a, th it, it, we're, we want to honor the, those that we're talking about by thanksgiving to God that he called and delivered them and gave them gifts and used them in different ways and used them also to bless us. The second is to strengthen our faith when we see God's mercy. And the third is the honor of imitation their faith and their works. This is just a, so Lu, this is what Luther's highlighting here. Look, the saints, um, they have to be sinners because all are sinners. But it's a blessing to us. Their sinfulness is a blessing to us because when we see God being merciful to sinners, we thank him that he's also merciful to us. Okay. 
So this is Luther. Look, I'm not unwilling, he says, to consider that Jacob was a liar. That's that's not off the table. But we have to, So there, and in this we're willing to have them as allies and examples to comfort us. Let us not think that they were statues, stones, or trunks of trees. But they were like ourselves. Example, Elijah received an answer from God to his prayer that it should not rain for three years, but later he felt his flesh trembling and begging that he should be allowed to die. That was an Old Testament lesson last week or the week before. But the upright deeds and words which are beyond censure should by no means be interpreted capaciously or so. Okay, so so Luther's saying here, look, it's possible that Jacob was lying. I'm not taking away this ability. But, but, when they do something right, we shouldn't stretch it to make it a sin. There's two temptations there when reading the stories of the Old Testament. The one is to think of these guys as perfect, like Luther says, like, statues or stones like they they had no none of the weaknesses that we have according to our sinful nature and but the other danger is to is to is to see everything that they did as wrong and that's really the danger that our day faces i think you could go back 50 years ago or 100 years ago and maybe they were tempted to think of the saints more highly than they ought but the, the problem with us now is that we're tempted to read these stories and see sin and we're in this iconoclastic age we're we're in the in this time of the rejection of heroes i mean even in like american history all, all the heroes that we learned about when we we're growing up have to be uh called out for their their sin and and their and their uh, all their flaws and everything like this so we're in this kind of iconoclastic age and so we we bring that to the to the scriptures and luther warns us their upright deeds and words which are beyond censure should by no means be interpreted capaciously and slanderously. Accordingly, we should not suspect Jacob of acting in a hypocritical and guileful manner with his brother, but there is in him a heart that is absolutely open and filled with boundless joy because of the reconciliation that's been brought about. It's free from care, devoid of all fear and sense of danger, so he has no reason for flattering or lying. But why did he not go to see her, although he had promised it? Sorry, let me make, move this here. Aha, there. Uh, my answer is that he did not promise that on this journey he wanted to go directly to Seir, but told Esau to proceed until he should follow him and come to Seir. But he went home to his aged father and visited him before he came to his brother in Seir. It's likely that he traveled to and fro to his brother in Seir or in some other place on several occasions. There's no doubt that both of them came together for the burial of their father. Again, to show his goodwill, Esau says that he's willing to assign to Jacob the attendants whom he had with him as a guard, but Jacob refuses because of the delay which he suffered on the journey and on account of so many hindrances would be annoying to them. I am quite satisfied, he said, to know that you are friendly toward me. So they both go their different ways after saying farewell. Esau to Seir, but Jacob to Succoth. Okay, so that takes us to the end of verse 16. Ah, we got time for more. So again, we're kind of working through the history. Remember what Luther says at the beginning of the chapter. This is a historical account. We can move fast. Let's move fast. Let's see. Maybe the sin of weakness would be that, let's see, David says, maybe the sin of weakness would be that he intended to go, but later realized that he couldn't make it, whereas the malicious sin, mortal sin, that drives out faith would be purposely lying. Could be. Preferred Luther's solution. That's good. I, I'm glad to see David talking to himself. <laughs> that is really, unless they have superpowers. Joe, I don't know exactly what that means. But this this is um, uh, this is a beautiful way of thinking about it's it's understanding in Jacob that we have a picture of how the Lord deals with our conscience. Verse seventeen. Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built himself a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is Succoth, which means booth. Um, oh, 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 I got what you're saying. Jill says, unless they have superpowers. You said we don't like heroes today unless they have superpowers. That's right. We, we're all about the superhero, but not like the normal hero, the person who can break down walls and jump over buildings or the, not the person who faithfully serves their neighbor in the calling that God has given. 
Gotcha. The city of Succoth was so called at this time from what was done. Jacob erected a shelter there for his cattle, built a house for his household. So here the Succoth is invented. This is the establishment of the town. And it's named after the booths that Jacob sets up there. The text sounds as if Jacob remained in that place for some time. And it was not only a slight detour or lodging for one day or night, but makes mention of a building, so indicates that he stayed there for some time. Lyra bases his comment on the opinion of the Hebrews and says that he dwelt there for a year and a half, and that this opinion gave rise to the question above whether Jacob lied since he promised that he would come to Seir and nevertheless remained a year and a half at Succoth. It's uncertain how long he remained there and whether he went to his brother or not, yet it could have taken place, and as uh, it is human and ordinary that they should attest their love by mutual service inasmuch as they were reconciled to each other. In the same manner, it's likely that the brothers often came together and kept their friendship warm and also produced the same among their grandsons and relatives. This, is this it seems to me, follows more correctly from the fact that the text says that Jacob dealt, dwelt in Succoth in a permanent shelter and in a furnished home than that he lied and did not go into his brother. So, so the text is saying, Moses is saying, that Jacob moved to Succoth. That doesn't mean he didn't go visit Seir. And remember, this is a thing that's important. Remember how small the promised land is. You can go one place to another and visit in a couple of days. It's important for us to think about this, that... Um, you know, we, we think of it as a huge, massive expanse because we have the wandering in the wilderness of the Israelites for 40 years as if it took 40 years to walk from Egypt to Israel. It only takes um, it only takes a couple, uh, like a week and a half to walk from Egypt to Israel. I was look, I was thinking about this on the this last weekend on the Elijah text because Elijah goes from the north down to Beersheba in the south. And then down to to um, Mount Hermon, which is on the Sinai Peninsula, and it says that he, he was sustained for 40 days, but it only takes about four days to walk from Beersheba to Mount Sinai. I mean, you got to walk straight through and you got to get moving. But it's not it's you know it's not forty days it's not forty years. There the, all these places are very close to each other. You can walk top to bottom in Israel in ten days, I imagine, without really trying. So, so that they, and they're traveling all around and back and forth and visiting each other and so forth and so on. Okay. Further, to make the additional statement in this passage, uh, in oh sorry, to make this additional statement in passing, I once held the view that Benjamin was born in this year of the return from Mesopotamia, but I found out that this view is false and that he was born in about the eighth year after the return. This is interesting. Luther correcting himself, he says, I used to think that this is when Benjamin was born, but I was wrong about that. It actually occurs eight years later. It's useful and necessary precaution to examine and remember the chronological order in sacred history. Paul prohibits the genealogy of persons, not the calculations of time, for this is a very helpful for the knowledge of Holy Scripture. This is... Um, I, I, this is, I, I don't, this is kind of, Luther is making an aside here. He even says, I need to make an aside. But, but this is, we should just pick up on this, is that working on determining the dates of these events is not fruitless and is in fact important. There is a, there is an approach to scripture. Well, so let me make a, a thesis a statement here, and then I'll kind of back it back it up with implications. Is that before the Bible comes to us as theology, it comes to us as history. Not all the Bible, you know, poems are not presenting themselves as 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 history. Parables are not presenting themselves to us as history. But most of the Bible presents itself to us as history, and this text is certainly presenting itself to us as history, as is all of Genesis, including Genesis 1, 2, and 3. It's giving us history. And there is a temptation to say, well, I don't want the Bible as history. I just want it as theology. Uh, that is, I do not think that is reading the text with integrity. And Luther here, when he's talking about the chronological order in sacred history, is giving us this idea that it is very helpful for the knowledge of Holy Scripture to have the dates down and to think of them in precision. 
The former, which is genealogies, the former is uncertain because of infinite confusions and almost impossible and such a great variety of second and third marriages and such great diversity of families, which are mixed in various ways. Often, as Lyra testifies somewhere, one man is named by two or three names or several men are called by one name. Therefore, a genealogy is an inexplicable and forbidden undertaking, and he who wishes to investigate these matters with too much curiosity undertakes a useless labor. But the reckoning of the times is necessary for this reason. And here, and this is an amazing thing which Luther's going to say, that the Jews might be convinced about the coming of Christ, for which most illustrious testimonies can be drawn from chronology. Although even this cannot be gathered so exactly, it makes a little difference even if the greatest precision cannot be obtained. Below, however, we shall have more to say about the reckoning of Jacob's years. Now, Luther says one of the, the best reasons why we're doing these things chronologically is it makes an apologetic for the, for the Jews on the coming of Christ. And he'll work this out in other places, especially in the dreaded on the Jews and their lies, where, where Luther is going to, he's going to make the case to the rabbis there who had published the tract on the Christians and their lies. And he's responding to that. How can you still have Moses and the prophets and not believe in Jesus? Because every because there's such specific promises that are given in the chronology of the Old Testament, the 70 weeks of Daniel and so forth. Luther even did, he wrote a, he he call, he did his own timeline of Old Testament history. I have, pulled it up because I have it here. Let's see if I can, uh, I have to share it. It's called the Supatio Anorum, something, something, something. And it look and here's what it looks like. This is the published. This is the the version that I got just from Google Books, and you can download it. And I and it's just it, Luther just made a column down the center of a page, and every ten years he has one little box for every year of the words of the existence of the world. Ten, ten, ten. Jacob born, or Jacob goes to, uh, Ra Jacob goes to, Haram. He's 77 years old. Eber dies 460, at 464 years old. It's funny how sometimes he has it in Latin and sometimes in German. Here's where we are now. Uh, and he's talking about the birth of Benjamin. Eight years after he goes, uh, Joseph is born and he has the family all here. This is the year 1,200. So he's noting the years on the other side. And he has the whole history of all of the Old Testament, and he kind of he's sorting all of these things out very accurately. Uh, I'd love to have. I don't think this has been translated into English. I think it'd be a great little project to to go through and and translate Luther's notes. Uh, I mean, you can really see it. I mean, it's 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 kind of messy um, because he's it's just a bunch of notes that he's taken. Let's see what it looks like at the beginning here. Where there's a cover, uh -huh. Supatatio Norum Mundi. That's on the on the ages of the world uh, by Dr. Martin Luther, 1541, which is probably uh, this 1541 is probably probably uh, three years before where we are in the Genesis commentary. It's kind of an amazing thing that this just gives us this. Ah. Uh, that 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 we're looking at the scripture um and honoring it as a history text that's the point okay uh let's see if we can land this plane go back to the text here uh Sukkoth, Peniel, Mahanaim are cities situated beyond the Jordan in the tribe of Gad later the Arabs occupied this land right up to the Jordan so it's obtained the name of Arabia in the history of the judges chapters 8 16 to 17, we're told that Succoth and Peniel were overthrown by Gideon because they'd refused to give bread to the exhausted army. At last, therefore, uh, after the servitude, exile, so many labors and temptations, God grants peace and rest to the patriarch Jacob so that he can live in safety and tranquility with his family and flocks and care for his property in the domestic sphere as it becomes, as he, as it becomes a father of a household, as it becomes, as it is right for a father of the household. Accordingly, 
He builds a house, teaches, and governs. The Holy Spirit regards it as worthy to describe all such matters carefully. First, that he might show this change in the life of the saints, which tribulations and consolations are accustomed to succeed, each other in turn and nature, the changes of day and night, winter and summer. God exercises the saints with great kindness and mercy, that they may not become dull in peace and tranquility, and that they may not become heartbroken in adversity. That, that is like a theme of this whole deal. The cross is necessary to humble the flesh so that it does not rebel and exercise dominion over the spirit. But affliction, which is without an end or breathing spaces, would shatter the spirit and drive to despair. So that there are seasons to the way that the Lord works these things. Marvelous. And he says, after all the trouble that Jacob has been through, 20 years of exile, he now finally has a home in the promised land. Therefore, God in his wonderful goodness tempers these according to Paul's rule in 1 Corinthians 10. God is faithful. He'll not let us be tempted beyond our strength. Often, indeed, he allows temptation to reach his peak and stage off ineffable groaning. Sorry, let me read that again. Often, indeed, he allows temptation to reach its peak and the stage of ineffable groaning. Luther talked about that for a long time, a few weeks back. But nevertheless, with the temptation, he also makes a way of escape so that we do not succumb and are able to bear it. As Paul says, we are struck down but not destroyed. This is the doctrine of the entire Scripture, which is set forth in this passage of an example of Jacob, namely, that there are alter, alternations of tribulation and consolation for this reason, that the body of sin may be mortified and may not be exalted in pride, and then that the spirit may not be devoured by sorrow and exhausted by terrors. It is God's will that precautions be taken against both courses, that we should not be proud according to the flesh. Therefore, he afflicts us not only with the preaching of the wall, but, but, but with the difficulties of this life, and also not despair according to the Spirit, but that we should be perceived by the middle way between sorrow and joy, between boasting and disgrace, between pride and despair. That's always this pendulum of pride and despair, and the Lord is knocking down our pride by the preaching of the law and lifting up our despair by the preaching of the gospel. For in this way the patriarch Jacob had many temptations, but after all these, he received consolation when he saw God's face and the face of his brother appeased. For after he crossed Peniel, his life was preserved. The night was passed. The sun, the sun shone forth. A little later, another temptation will follow. There's a second reason why the Holy Spirit set forth these uh, matters, namely to testify that all the works of the saints, however lowly and childish they may be, are pleasing and acceptable as good fruits in the sight of God. This is just great. Included, uh, let's see if we can finish the paragraph. Included are not only those sublime theological virtues, like contests with death, sin, and other temptations, and the victories over the same fraught with great perils, but even those lowly domestic and humble services, so that we may learn to regulate our lives in this manner, that we may be certain that we're pleasing to God in all of our acts of duty. We are, I do not always pray, I do not always meditate on the law of the Lord and struggle continue with sin, death, and the devil, but I put on my clothes, I sleep, I play with the children, eat, drink. If all these are done in faith, they are approved by God's judgment as having been done rightly. Hmm. All right. This is great. Uh, I think this, I, I want to stop here and I want to probably next week grab a couple of these summary statements that Luther is talking about and press down through the to the end of the chapter. But let's pray, and I'll stop the recording and then see what, uh, and we'll see what we you guys have in the chat. Oh, Lord, we give you thanks that you have so comforted Jacob by your word and presence and promises that his faith now sees your shining face and the joy of this life and life eternal, the reconciliation with his brother Esau. We pray that you would so deliver us to a good conscience that heaven and earth would all smile upon us and that we would live our lives free from fear. We ask this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. All right.